were spent. I have no doubt in my mind that money was spent, but it's like pulling teeth to find out how it was spent. Comptroller General of the United States, David Walker, tonight at 8 Eastern and Pacific on C-SPAN's Q&A. And now we take you back to Thursday's hearing on steroid use in Major League Baseball. Coming up, parents of young people who died from steroid use, they share their concerns with the committee. Afterwards, medical professionals weigh in on the debate over baseball's new plan for testing players. This portion of the hearing is about 2 hours 20 minutes. It is chaired by Virginia Congressman Tom Davis. I want to move to our second panel of witnesses, and members will be coming and filtering in as we return from boats. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Denise and Mr. Raymond uh, Garibaldi, the parents of former USC baseball player Rob Garibaldi, who committed suicide after steroid use. We have Mr. Donald Hooten, Sr., the director, chairman, and president of Taylor Hooten Foundation and father of high school baseball player Taylor Hooten, who committed suicide after steroid use. We have Dr. Nora D. Volkoff, the Director, National Institute of Drug Abuse, National Institute of Health. Dr. Gary I. Wadler, Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine, New York University School of Medicine. And we have Dr. Kirk Brower, Associate Professor of Psychiatry, University of Michigan Medical School, and Executive Director, Chelsea Arbor Addiction Treatment Center, and Dr. Elliot J. Pellman, the Medical Advisor to Major League Baseball. We ask unanimous consent that the written statement of uh, Mr. Efren and Brenda uh, Marrero be inserted in the record, and hearing no objection, uh, so ordered. Uh, it's a policy of this committee that all witnesses be sworn before you testify. So if you'd rise with me and raise your right hands. Solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Your entire statements are in the record. There is a light in front that will turn green when you start. It will turn yellow after four minutes and red after five. Uh, this is a very important subject, and I think to some of you know, we understand if you have to go over, um, but I just want to advise you that your entire statement is in the record. Uh, this is a very important topic, and I thank each of you for taking the time to be here with us today to share it. Uh, Mr. and Dr. Garibaldi, I'll, I'll start with you. Honorable Davis and members of the committee, as a licensed psychologist and more so parent, I thank you for the honor of addressing this committee today. My husband's and my personal efforts, interest in your efforts emanates from our son Rob, who with the exception of his size, had all the makings of a professional baseball player. We were living on the San Francisco Peninsula when Rob was a little leaguer, watching with excitement the accomplishments of his local sports heroes, Barry Bonds and the Bash brothers, Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco. Their successes fueled his dreams. He had both the talent and the desire. To Rob, baseball was life. By the time he reached high school, his skill at baseball was considered remarkable. In fact, his dream of playing in the major leagues came very close to reality. Dr. Rob Garibaldi, could you pull the microphone a little closer? Because as they open the doors and stuff, it's just a little there. Thank you. Rob turned down the New York Yankees in 1999 in order to accept a full scholarship at the University of Southern California. And then he played for USC in the 2000 College World Series. As a teen, Rob was told by all working with him, coaches, trainers, and scouts, that the only way to improve his game was to get bigger. With the exception of size, he had all the tools major league scouts considered in a potential draftee. Running speed, throwing skills, defensive skills, and hitting skills. Getting bigger began with working out diligently and using creatine. <laughs> Creatine was supplied by a scouting team sponsored by the California Angels when he was 15. In fact... Mr. Garibald, could you move the microphone closer to you, too? This is very important. I want everyone to hear this. Thank you. In fact, this and other performance-enhancing supplements, such of which the FDA purport as food, were given to him throughout his baseball career. We were told they were like vitamins. 
When weightlifting, nutrition, and supplements did not produce the desired results, Rob was encouraged to obtain and use steroids. Rob obtained his first cycle of steroids after graduating high school. He traveled to Tijuana, Mexico with a friend and within an hour had a prescription and purchased steroids from a pharmacy there for himself and other friends. Rob also implicated his trainer at USC as assisting his use of steroids so as to gain 20 pounds. At 16, 5'9", and 130 pounds, Rob was far from being a prototype designated by major league scouts as desirable. Their goal weight for Rob was 185 pounds. By the 2002 major league draft, steroids had made good on their promise. Rob was a power hitter, 5'11", and, and weighed 185 pounds but he was not drafted. Steroids had taken an insidious hold with scouts commenting he was a head case. Even though his mom and I confronted him about his weight gain, upper body muscle development, puffy red face, hair loss, and acne, all symptoms of steroid use, he denied his use. Most disturbing were the adverse psychiatric effects he demonstrated over time. Mania, depression, short-term memory loss, uncontrollable rage, delusional and suicidal thinking, and paranoid psychosis, symptoms he never acknowledged as being problems. Prior to steroids, Rob never displayed any of these symptoms. When not on steroids or withdrawn from them, Rob was a sweet and empathetic guy with ambitions beyond baseball. When disabled by steroids, his character and demeanor so drastically changed that he was dismissed by the coaching staff at USC as a behavioral problem. During this time, no one recognized his symptoms as being somewhat other than aggregated depression or bipolar disorder. Rob also never thought the known physical consequences as being serious, having heart or liver disease or being sterile or issues he would think about after baseball. At our insistence, Rob eventually cooperated with psychiatric treatment. He was hospitalized in an inpatient psychiatric unit involuntary, was prescribed antidepressants and antipsychotics, and went to a residential treatment facility. But his depression was unsurmountable. On October 1st, 2002, in his car, a half a block from our home, Rob shot himself in the head. He was 24. We support your every effort to implore your continued efforts to purge steroids from baseball and inform and legislate law that guides the general public. Our children are using the same performance enhancing supplements and drugs as professional athletes. Research is showing that in an early age, intake of these supplements creates a mindset that prompts steroid use later. Grave and misinformation such as that in Jose Canseco's recent account in his book Juice continues to be disseminated. Because of ignorance, denial of these athletes who refuse to testify without subpoenas and opinions touted as fact, coaches, scouts, and parents will continue to make misinformed statements to those in their charge. Even though Mr. Canseco states on the first page that steroids are for adult use, youth are not afraid to take the risk of losing their health or their lives to emulate their heroes or to help guarantee a place on a team, a scholarship, their physique, or competitive edge. I have a question. If the federal government has designated steroids as illegal unless prescribed by a physician, why did Major League Baseball have to ban their use before ball players could be sanctioned for using them? Our chi children are reading Juiced right now, watching Barry Bonds lie right, down, right now, getting permission from their role models right now to use. Canseco states and his counterparts imply that as long as you trust your instincts, control carefully the amounts, administer them at a proper time, and be smart, careful, and know what you're doing, full potential can be reached. I'd like to know where Dr. Canseco got his research. Because what we know is that without steroid use, Rob's suffering and ultimately his death would have been averted. How many more youngsters will die questing ego and fame through steroids? There's no doubt in our mind that anabolic steroids caused our son to unexpectedly assault his father and choke him until he was restrained by two men. There's no doubt in our minds that steroids killed our son. Ultimately, we do blame Rob for his use. He surrendered his well-being and integrity. 
He made his choice, and we must now live with the consequences. However, with his sports heroes as examples and Major League Baseball's blind eye, Rob's decision was a product of erroneous information and promises. In his mind, he did what baseball players like Canseco has done and McGuire and Bonds are believed to have done. Rob fiercely argued, I don't do drugs, I'm a ball player. This is what ball players do. If Bonds has to do it, then I must. We miss him terribly. In Rob's name and the name of athletic excellence, we thank the committee for defining and demanding responsibility for those who are admired and for communicating to our nation that the win at all costs cost attitude that prevails is much too dangerous a game for our youth or for anyone. Baseball is not life. Baseball is a game. Thank you very much. Mr. Hooten. Mr. Davis, Mr. Waxman, Congressman. Twenty short months ago, our youngest son, Taylor, took his own life. He was two weeks away from beginning his senior year in high school. He was carrying a 3.8 average, made excellent scores on his SAT tests, and he and I were preparing to make college visits. Taylor was well liked by all who knew him. Adults tell us he was one of the nicest young men they ever knew, extremely well mannered. His kids thought he was one of the nicest kids on campus, uh, a real ladies man, quite a charmer. This past spring, Taylor would have been a starting pitcher on his varsity baseball team. But during the fall of his junior year, his JV coach told this six foot three, 175 pound young man that he needed to get bigger in order to improve his chances of making the varsity team. Taylor resorted to using anabolic steroids to help him achieve his objective. And like the Garibaldis, I am absolutely convinced that Taylor's secret use of anabolic steroids played a significant role in causing the depression the severe depression that resulted in his suicide. And I've also learned that the events leading up to and including Taylor's suicide are right out of the medical textbook on steroids. Experts put the usage of steroids amongst our high school kids at about five to six percent of the overall population. Some of the experts I talked to use numbers more like a million kids doing steroids, not 500,000, and I have a personal belief that those numbers are the bottom end of the range, that that number's higher. In some parts of the country, studies show that the usage amongst high school junior and senior males is as high as 11 to 12 percent. Let me put that in context. The kids in my part of the country tell me that as many as one-third of the boys that show up to play football under the lights on Friday night are juicing. A number of factors are contributing to the increase in usage amongst our kids. You've asked me to talk about one of them, and I'm happy to do that. I believe the poor example being set by professional athletes is a major catalyst fueling the high usage of steroids amongst our kids. Our kids look up to these guys. They want to do the things the pros do to be successful. And with this in mind, I have several messages for the professional athletes. First, I am sick and tired of having you tell us that you're, you don't want to be considered role models. If you haven't figured it out yet, let me break the news to you that whether you like it or not, you are role models. And parents across America should hold you accountable for behavior that inspires our kids to do things that put their health at risk and that teaches them that the ethics we try to teach them around our kitchen table somehow don't apply to them. Second, our kids know that the use of anabolic steroids is high amongst professional athletes. They don't need to read Mr. Conseco's new book to know that something other than natural physical ability is providing many of you with the ability to break so many performance records that provide you with the opportunity to make those millions of dollars. Our youngsters hear the message loud and clear, and it's wrong. If you would want to achieve your goal, it's okay to use steroids to get you there because the pros are doing it. It's a real challenge for parents to overpower the strong message that's, been sent, that's being sent to our children by your behavior. Third, 
players that are guilty of taking steroids are not only cheaters, you are cowards. You're afraid to step on the field to compete for your positions and play the game without the aid of substances that are a felony to possess without a legitimate prescription, substances that have been banned from competition at all levels of athletics. Not only that, you are cowards when it comes to facing your fans and our children. Why don't you behave like we try to teach our kids to behave? Show our kids that you're man enough to face authority, tell the truth, and face the consequences. Instead, you hide behind the skirts of your union, and with the help of management and your lawyers, you've made every effort to resist facing the public today. What message are you sending our sons and daughters? That you're above the law? that you can continue to deny your behavior and get away with it, that somehow you're not a cheater unless you get caught. Your attorneys say they're worried about how your public testimony might play in a court of law. But how do you think your refusals to talk are playing in the court of public opinion? Let me tell you that the national jury of young people have already judged your actions and com concluded that many of you are guilty of using illegal performance enhancing drugs. But instead of convicting you, they have decided to follow your lead. And in tens of thousands of homes across America, our 16 and 17 year old children are injecting themselves with anabolic steroids, just like you big leaguers do. Your union leaders want, to, want us to be sensitive to your right of privacy. Right to privacy? What about our rights as parents? Our rights to expect that the adults that our kids all look up to will be held to a standard that does not include behavior that is dangerous, felonious, and is cheating. How about a short message for management? We can't leave them out. Major League Baseball and other sports need to take serious steps to stop the use of steroids. Slapping a player on the wrist with a 10-day suspension, I didn't even know about the $10,000 thing until this morning, but a 10-day suspension is just one more signal to our children that you're not serious about ridding the game of this junk. Forcing a pro, even at worst, to miss 10 games is asking him to mix, miss 6% of a season. Let's put that through the prism of the glasses of a high school student. Forcing a high school student to miss 6% of his season is asking him to sit the bench for less than one game. And we shouldn't be talking about whether or not to put asterisks next to these guys' records. They ought to be thrown out of baseball, and we ought to be turning them over to the authorities to have them arrested and put in jail for the behavior that they've done. Why don't you implement a program that we've heard about today that's a lot closer to the Olympic standard where cheaters are not able to compete for two years after their first offense and banned for life following the second? Just maybe our kids will get the message that you're finally serious about solving this problem. Let me add to the whole discussion that this is not about a collective bargaining agreement. Guys, we are way past that. Steroid usage has become a major health issue and that is affecting the lives and health of our kids, and I encourage the members of Congress to please deal with it in such a manner. A critical weapon that we have in this, in this, uh, in this battle is education. Our students need to know that these drugs can seriously harm them, but I'm convinced that trying to warn 16-year-olds about the danger of liver cancer or having a heart attack probably going to fall on deaf ears which is why I believe our first targets for education have to be our parents and our coaches. Our parents need to know the dangers of this drug, how to recognize the warning sign, and understand the importance of supervising this with our kids. Our coaches have to be more responsible and accountable for dealing with this situation with their teams. Coaches across the country need to be certified and credentialed to have to pass a test to prove that they are competent to supervise our children. As part of the certification, they need to be trained about steroids and other performance enhancing drugs and trained to know what to do about it when they find it. And finally, they need to be held accountable for ensuring that their teams are steroid free. To help fill the education void, we have formed the <laughs> Taylor Hooten Foundation for Fighting Steroid Abuse, 
the nation's first uh, private organization uh, in this area, working in conjunction with doctor experts like Dr. Gary Wadler here on my left. We would like to explore ways to work with you and others in the government to make your founda uh, our foundation a part of your work going forward. On behalf of my son, Taylor Hooten, Rob Garibaldi, and Efren Marrero, whose parents are with us today, let me implore you to take steps to clean up this mess. Please help us to see that our children's lives were not lost in vain. You have the power to do something about it, and we're counting on you to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hooten. Ms. Volker. Dr. Volkoff, thank you for being with us. You need to push your button. You have a button to turn it on. That's right. Now move it up close. There it is, yes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, it is my privilege to be here today to discuss the sci what science has taught us about the serious health consequences of anabolic steroid abuse. We are now facing a very me damaging message that is becoming pervasive in our society, that bigger is better, and being the best is more important than how you get there. We are here today because of the reports of anabolic steroid abuse by professional athletes, many of whom are regarded as role models by today's young people. There is great, great risk that adolescents will be vulnerable to these messages and will be far less concerned about the long-term health risks to their bodies and their minds. What are anabolic steroids and how do they affect the body? Anabolic steroids are synthetic versions of the primary male sex hormone, testosterone. They can be injected, taken orally, or transdermally. They promote the growth of skeletal muscle and the development of male sexual characteristics. Anabolic steroids are controlled substances which can be prescribed to treat conditions such as body wasting in patients with AIDS and other diseases that occur when the body produces abnorm abnormally low levels of testosterone. However, the doses prescribed to treat these conditions are 10 to 100 times lower than the doses that are abused for performance enhancement. Let me be clear, although anabolic steroids can enhance certain types of performance and appearance, they are dangerous drugs. And when used inappropriately, they can cause a host of severe, long-lasting, and often irreversible negative health consequences. These drugs can stunt the height of growing adolescents, masculinize women, and alter sex characteristics in men. Anabolic steroids can lead to heart attacks, strokes, liver tumors, kidney failure, and serious psychiatric problems. In addition, because steroids are often injected, users risk contracting or transmitting HIV or hepatitis. The research also indicates that anabolic steroids directly affect the brain. They affect some of the same reward circuits as other drugs of abuse, and with repeated use can produce addiction. However, they also affect areas in the brain that are normally regulated by sex hormones, and these actions account for many of the behavioral changes that occur with steroid abuse, such as aggression, depression, psychosis, mania. Some of these consequences persist long after the person stops taking the drug. Indeed, depression induced by steroid withdrawal can result in suicide weeks after drug discontinuation. Anabolic steroid abuse differs from the abuse of other illicit substances in that the initial use is not driven for the desire of the high or the euphoria that happens with drugs such as cocaine, marijuana, or heroin but the desire of the abuser to in enhance their performance and appearance, characteristics that are extremely important for adolescents. These effects of steroids, in addition, can boost confidence and strength, leading the abuser to overlook the potentially serious long-term damages that these substances can cause. I am pleased to say that NIDA has supported research that led to, two, that to the development of two highly effective prevention programs, ATLAS, targeting male athletes, and ATINA, targeting female athletes, which not only prevent anabolic steroid abuse, but also promote other healthy behaviors and attitudes in adolescents. 
because school-sponsored athletics involve about 50% of high school students, these programs, which are sports-based, provide the opportunity to reach a large number of adolescents. Influential coaches and peer groups provide information on sports nutrition and appropriate strength training as alternatives to the use of drugs to improve performance and build confidence. Atlas and Athena have been adopted by schools in 29 states and Puerto Rico, both Congress and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administrations have endorsed ATLAS and ATINA as model prevention programs, which could and should be implemented in more communities throughout the country. In response to the increasing alarming use of steroids in adolescents, NIDA invested in public education efforts to increase the awareness of the dangers of steroids abuse. Beginning in 2000, we created a new website focused on steroid abuse, developed informational material for healthcare professionals and the public, and aired public ser service television announcements. In summary, we know that the inappropriate use of anabolic steroids can have catastrophic medical, psychiat psychiatric, and behavioral consequences. For this reason, we're very concerned about the misleading positive messages being conveyed on the abuse of these drugs by well-known professional athletes. This could undermine our prevention and education efforts. NIDA will continue to bring the power of science to bear on these issues. I thank you for your attention and interest and would ple be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Volkoff. Uh, Dr. Wadler, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appear before this committee wearing multiple hats. I am an associate professor of clinical medicine at NYU School of Medicine and represent the United States as a member of the World Anti-Doping Agency's Prohibited List and Methods Committee. I'm a fellow of the largest sports medicine organization in the world, the American College of Sports Medicine, and I'm the lead author of the textbook, Drugs and the Athlete. In 1993, I received the International Olympic Committee's President's Prize for my work in doping. I have served as an expert on anabolic steroids to the Department of Justice, and since 1999, I have advised the Office of National Drug Control Policy on matters of doping. Since appearing before the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation in 1999 to discuss the use of performance-enhancing drugs in Olympic competition, there has been a sea change on many fronts. At the federal level, we have witnessed great strides in the fight against doping. The President highlighted the issue in his 2004 State of the Union. The Department of Justice has pursued the Balco investigation, and the FDA removed ephedra and androstenedione Dione from the store shelves. Just last month, the Anabolic Steroid Control Act of 2004 became effective, adding numerous steroid precursors to the list of steroids controlled under the Act. Internationally, the United States, with the Office of National Drug Control Policy at the helm, has played a leadership role in the formation of the World Anti-Doping Agency, its governance and funding, and most recently in drafting the Anti-Doping Convention under the auspices of UNESCO. In 2004, the United States government contributed an unprecedented $1.45 million towards WADA's budget of $23 million, and last year $7.5 million was appropriated to support our national anti-doping agency, the United States Anti-Doping Agency, known as USADA, for testing, research, and education. With this as a backdrop, one must ask the question, where have we gone astray with Major League Baseball, and why should we care? Perhaps the seminal moment in surfacing the issue of performance-enhancing drug use in baseball was the 1998 revelation that Mark McGuire had used Andrastine Dione during his record-breaking 70-home run season. At the time, McGuire did not violate the laws of the land, nor the laws of baseball. Both were to change. The 2002 assertions of Jose Canseco and the late Ken Caminetti that steroid abuse was rampant in baseball were dismissed by many in organized baseball as being hyperbolic. How, however, last week, Mr. Seeley acknowledged that in 2001, 11% of minor league players had tested positive. And baseball's own 2003 steroid survey testing had revealed that even with its very poorest testing program, as many as 5 to 10 percent of players had tested positive, the equivalent of two entire major league teams. Last week, we learned that in 2004, 
1 to 2 percent tested positive, which still translates to an unacceptable number of users between 12 to 24 league-wide, the equivalent of a half to a full roster. The incidence would likely have been higher if the testing had been performed as it should have been year-round, in and out of competition, on a random, no-notice basis. To put these figures in perspective, compare Major League Baseball statistics with those of the World Anti-Doping Agency, where less than one-half percent of 150,000 tests rigorously administered worldwide in 2003 were positive for steroids. One can only conclude that the prior assertions of rampant steroid abuse in baseball likely were not hyperbolic. And why should we care? We should care for many reasons, but perhaps most notable is that baseball, our national pastime, for better or for worse, is a role model sport and likely contributes to the alarming abuse of anabolic steroids by teenagers. Just reflect on the enormous increase in sales of Andro the year after Mark McGuire broke Roger Maris's long-standing home run record. The most recent data from the annual National Institutes of Drug Abuse Survey reveals that in 2004, 3.4 percent of 12th graders had used these drugs at some time in their life, and as many as 1.9 percent of 8th graders had used them. And even more alarming is the perception amongst high school students that they are harmful has dropped from 71 percent in 1992 to only 56 in 2004. And let me assure you from a public health perspective that the abuse of these drugs is harmful both physically and behaviorally. Their abuse can lead to an array of physical problems, some predictable, such as feminization of the male, some not, such as premature heart disease, some permanent, and some not. But baseball's problem is not limited to steroids. One can only wonder why baseball's new drug policy does not explicitly ban amphetamines, a Schedule III drug. It was amphetamine abuse that gave rise to both the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 and to the development of the Olympic Banned Substances List in 1968, following the first recorded fatalities from performance-enhancing drugs, namely amphetamines. And while ephedra is now banned in baseball, subsequent to the heat stroke death of Stephen Beckler, and it's being banned by the FDA, one should not lose sight of the fact that ephedra is closely related to the stimulant amphetamine. Why ephedra is banned by Major League Baseball, while amphetamines are not, remains an enigma. The position that the Players Association has taken with respect to amphetamines certainly leads one to suspect that they too are endemic in baseball. Finally, a few words about Major League Baseball's new drug policy testing program, which I had a brief chance to review. In my judgment, the policy at best, as we know it, can best be described as one of incrementalism, one designed to silence its critics but not one designed to seriously rid professional baseball of the abuse of all performance-enhancing drugs. And to be sure, the devil is in the details, as we heard this morning with the word or. For example, while human growth hormone is on baseball's banned list, baseball will not conduct blood testing, which is the only way it can be currently detected. Doping is an exquisitely complex subject involving the interplay of numerous disciplines. In my opinion, the complexity of anti-doping far exceeds the capacity of baseball to design, implement, and monitor an effective, transparent, and accountable program. It's embodied in the world anti excuse me, how, uh, it is embodied in the world's anti-doping code, which I distributed to you this morning, and its international standards, and Major League Baseball should embrace them as have other high-profile high professional sports, such as men's professional tennis, soccer, and cycling. Organized baseball should heed the experience of the Olympic movement, which recognized that its very credibility was cracking under the weight of doping, and so it passed the anti-doping baton to WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, and to the national anti-doping agencies, such as USADA. I am pleased to note that baseball has taken one significant step in that direction by con contracting out its anti-doping laboratory services to a WADA-certified accredited laboratory. At a minimum, and now I'm being very, very specific, as a next step, Major League Baseball should adopt the WADA list, which I distributed this morning, of prohibited substances and methods in its entirety. The list is a continuously evolving product reflecting countless man hours by scientists and physicians from around the world. It is endorsed by sporting bodies worldwide as well as by world governments, 
including the United States. While the potential of a two-year sanction for steroid abuse as called for in the World Anti-Doping Code may make baseball hesitant to embrace the code, baseball should be mindful that the code calls for sanctions to be reduced in, quote, exceptional circumstances, close quote, and provides for the possible reduction or elimination of the period of ineligibility in the unique circumstances where the athlete can establish that he had no fault or negligence in connection with the violation. And furthermore, the United States Anti-Doping Agency, USADA, is in the best position to implement the best practices of doping control in baseball in conformity with the requirements of the World Anti-Doping Code. Finally, only when baseball demonstrates its unabashed commitment to drug-free sport will it fully regain the confidence of its fans and once again deservedly become America's favorite pastime. Thank you. Thank you. Our next witness is Dr. Kirk Brower, Associate Professor of Psychiatry, University of Michigan Medical School, and Executive Director of the Chelsea Arbor Addiction Treatment Center. I want to thank members of Congress for inviting me to testify here today. I will focus mostly on psychiatric side effects. Um, may I have first slide, please? Illicit use of anabolic androgenic steroids has been associated with a variety, uh, not mine, has been associated with a variety of adverse psych psychiatric effects. We can, we can cancel that slide since it's not mine. Illicit use of anabolic androgenic steroids has been associated with a variety of adverse psychiatric effects, which I define here as disturbances in mood, thinking, behavior, and perception. The most frequently described of these effects are major mood swings, ranging from mania to depression, suicidal thoughts, and behaviors marked aggression, including homicidal thoughts and behaviors, sometimes called by users roid rage. In addition, grandiose and paranoid delusions and addiction can occur. Mania, or its less severe form known as hypomania, aggression and delusions typically begin during a course of using steroids, whereas depressive episodes and suicide attempts are most likely to occur within three months of stopping use, that is, during the period we call steroid withdrawal. Fortunately, most psychiatric effects we believe, such as mood swings, are reversible with medically monitored cessation of steroid use, but not always as you have heard this morning. Suicides and homicides are obviously irreversible. In adolescence, psychiatric effects of illicit steroid use are not well studied, but this age group may be particularly vulnerable. Adolescents are already subject to the normal surges of sex hormones during puberty, which are associated with expected, albeit sometimes problematic, changes in mood and behavior, which everyone who has a teenage child at home knows. Thus, taking additional sex hormones in the form of steroids could potentially exacerbate the usual degree of psychological upset normally observed during adolescence. Suicide is the third leading cause of death among young people aged 15 to 24 years of age, following unintentional injuries and homicide. This statistic is especially troubling because steroids can increase suicide risk in an age group that is already at risk. The true rate of adverse psychiatric effects among steroid users is unknown. One controlled study of 160 athletes reported that 11% were diagnosed with major depression and that the psychiatric effects were dose related. The higher the dose, the greater the risk. Another study found that 3.9% of 77 illicit steroid users had made suicide attempts during the withdrawal period. Rates of completed suicides, however, are especially hard to estimate. In a series of 34 forensically evaluated deaths among male steroid users, 11 users committed suicide, 9 were victims of homicide, 12 deaths were judged as accidental, and two were indeterminate. The gold standard of drug studies is the placebo-controlled double-blind randomized trial. There are at least four such studies that employed relatively high doses of steroids in human subjects. Averaging across studies, the incidence of prominent irritability or hypomania was 5%. 
Another study found that during steroid withdrawal, 10% developed significant depressive symptoms, including 3.2% who met full criteria for major depression. These gold standard studies, however, are likely to underestimate psychiatric effects. Illicit steroid users, as you've been told, typically consume 10 to 100 times the therapeutic dose. By contrast, the maximum doses that can be ethically prescribed in the gold standard studies are five to six times the therapeutic dose, or up to 20 times less than that that illicit users take. At least 165 cases of addiction or dependence on steroids have been documented in the medical literature. In individuals who chronically consumed high doses and combinations of steroids taken as pills and or injections for non-medical purposes. No cases of dependence have been associated with legitimate prescriptions of steroids used at therapeutic doses for medical purposes. How teenagers and student athletes regard the use of steroids by professional athletes has not been investigated. However, studies of other drugs suggest the following. First, the adolescent's peer group is probably a more important influence than adults, although adult role models can be important. Second, adolescents' use of a drug is influenced by their perception of how harmful that drug is. In other words, the more harmful they perceive a drug, the less likely they will take it. They will take it. And unfortunately, use of steroids by famous athletes who appear so well in the media probably contributes to the perception that steroids are not harmful. Thank you. Last witness on this panel is Dr. Elliot Pellman, the medical advisor to Major League Baseball. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to begin by thanking the committee for the opportunity to be present this morning. Unlike some other medical professionals that you have heard from today, I have had extensive experience in the area of professional sports. This morning, I would like to offer you three important medical perspectives that are relevant to the development or evaluation of any steroid policy. I would also like to discuss the medical and educational effort efforts that form a key component of Major League Baseball steroid policies. Although there is, understandably, a serious lack of studies in this area, my personal belief is that anabolic steroid use has significant associated health risks. Most physicians agree that steroid abuse can increase the risk of heart disease, certain types of cancer, sterility, and can lead to depression and aggressive and at times inappropriate behavior. More importantly, in professional sports, anabolic steroids can create a working environment that is unfair and unbalanced. Those who use steroids have a competitive advantage and others may feel forced to take steroids to even the playing field. When one, when one fully appreciates this perspective, it becomes clear that steroid use is like an insidious, contagious disease. In structuring programs to deal with steroids, it is important to approach steroids like the disease it is. Second, the complexity of the steroid problem in professional sports in America has been significantly increased by the federal government's deregulation of nutritional supplements and pro-hormones in the 1990s. Despite recent changes in the law, there is an entire generation that has been potentially contaminated by the belief that the uses of such substances is in fact legitimate. In creating an effective drug program, one must take into account the reality of the damage that has been caused by the deregulation of nutritional supplements. Last, in evaluating the severity of penalties imposed under any program, an element of reality is necessary. My experience in the National Football League suggests that, that, that other than deliberate cheating, the most common reason for a positive test is the ingestion of a dietary supplement that is contaminated with a banned substance that is not listed on the label. When one begins talking about two-year suspensions or lifetime bans for professional athletes, 
it is important to remember that while athletes must be forced to take responsibility for what they put in their bodies, honest mistakes do occur. Commissioner Selig has described in some detail for all of you the substance of the Major League Baseball's new, trust, new drug testing program. I am also very familiar with the National Football League's program. On balance, baseball program compares favorably with any of the other professional sports leagues, including the NHL, the NBA, and the PGA. Above a certain critical threshold of testing, there will always be individuals, whether or not baseball, NFL, NCAA, and the Olympics, who will attempt to circumvent or cheat the testing program. This point is perhaps illustrated by the alleged use of athletes of several different sports of THG, the design of steroid that is, center of the, that is the center of the BALCO investigation. Therefore, the intent of a testing program must be to try to create an environment that is conducive for athletes to perform without feeling the need to cheat by taking steroids. But the program must also be flexible and innovative enough to change as the types of drugs change. I am comfortable that baseball program, like the NFL's, meets this goal. Our efforts with respect to steroids, however, are much broader than just drug testing and discipline. Last year, the Major League Baseball's medical staff visited in person all 30 Major League camps to provide players and baseball operations personnel an educational program on the health risks associated with the use of steroids. Participation in this program was mandatory, and we have followed up last year's program with individual calls or visits to presently approximately two-thirds of the teams. Major League Baseball continues to believe that the issue of steroids also may, must be addressed from the bottom up. As you know, Commissioner Selig implemented a very aggressive minor league drug testing program in 2001. That program has continually been refined and strengthened. As a supplement to the testing program, we have produced a professional quality video in English and Spanish, which details the health risks and problems associated with steroid use. Minor league programs must view this video every year. We significantly enhance this educational video this off season, and the new video has been or will be shown in every minor league camp this spring. We have also made resources available to players that can be utilized on an individual basis. For example, we have entered into a contractual arrangement with a hotline that is available to provide players with information about what substances are included in particular dietary supplements. We have also strengthened and educated the employee assistant providers program at each individual club so that they are in a position to deal effectively with steroid-related issues associated with the major league and minor league players. We have also used the medical staffs on the individual teams as a resource in combating steroid use. Each of the last two years, we have had mandatory meetings for physicians and athletic trainers to educate and instruct them on the dangers of steroid use and to review with them the uncertainties associated with players using dietary supplements. A major component of that program is to emphasize to all club personnel that serious disciplinary ramifications they face in the event they enable use by any player, major league or minor league. Our educational efforts have extended to the highest levels of management in the game. Over the last two years, I have addressed the assembly of all general managers on two separate occasions on the issue of steroids and performance enhancing substances. I have also had the opportunity to discuss steroid performance enhancing substances at two separate owners meetings as well. My strong sense is that on all levels of management in baseball are committed to the elimination of these substances. In this regard, there is no difference between the leadership in the commissioner's office, between Major League Baseball, and the leadership of the National Football League. Looking ahead, Major League Baseball is committed to making every effort to eliminate the use of performance enhancing agents, substances from this, from this sport. 
we are working to establish a program that will provide I'm sorry, nutritional products to players that can be used without concern about potential contamination with pro-hormones. We are also working closely with the World Anti-Doping Agency Certified Laboratory, UCLA, to make sure that baseball is completely abreast of developments in the area of design of steroids. Finally, Major League Baseball is currently in the process of developing a funding arrangements that will hopefully speed the development of a urine test for human growth hormone. Thank you. Dr. Pellman, thank you, and I want to thank all of our witnesses uh, here. Uh, I'm going to start the questioning uh, with Mr. Sweeney. I thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, and uh, I know we have other panels coming that are of uh, greater celebrity than, than maybe this panel is, but I happen to think this is the most important panel we're going to face today. Uh, it starts with the notion and the idea and our deepest gratitudes to the Garibaldis and, and, and Mr. Hooten for your courage in being here and for your commitment to keep fighting and please know that you have our sympathies and, and our best wishes. Um, I, I have so many questions in, to ask in such little time. I want to try to get to them as quickly as I can. Mr. Hooten, I, I just want to assure you that I have a bill in probes uh, to create such an education program. I would love to work with all of you uh, on the panel and trying to get it more perfected as we go forward. Um, I want to get to the scientists, though, because I think, I think it's really kind of important. Um, Dr. W Wadler, uh, you are not a member of USADA, correct? WADA is a different organization. I am not a member so of you USADA. So you, you have no vested interest I here. have no I vested interest at point. all. Um, you mentioned that Major League Baseball does use your labs. Uh, they, my understanding is they have used uh, actually the Montreal lab is what I understand, but a WADA accredited lab, yes. And you mentioned that in your testimony that you uh, hope that they will adopt your list of uh, prohibited substances. That's not the case now, correct? That's correct. You have the capacity to test for those in your labs now? Yes, we do. Um, I want to make this point to you, and I, and I hope you can re reinforce it, that lab testing is only the final step in this process. That's correct. And in the current Major League Baseball agreement, um, or whatever the status of it is, because I'm, I'm, I'm confused as to whether it's a in play or not in play at this point. There is no process in place other than the lab testing. In, in other words, the chain of custody uh, that is critically important here, uh, the monitoring of athletes during testing, uh, during the entire test and the amount of tests and the randomness of those tests are sketchy. Now, I, I have other questions that Dr. Pellman can answer on the randomness of it, but. Yes, uh, I did not mention because of time, but World Anti-Doping Code, which you have, there are a ser series of international standards, which are highly complex documents. The one on testing, which I'm glad to make available to you, and it's on the WADA website, is 41 pages of highly detailed information of the utmost importance, remembering that these cases tend to be adjudicated and issues of a legal nature are incredibly important. So the standard is spelled out, it's used worldwide. Does it make any sense, and I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I am going yeah. to try to rush it. Does it make any sense not to employ a group like USADA to, uh, to oversee that chain of custody into the lab process to you? I, I personally believe there's no reason why this should not be done by an agency Thank such as you, USADA. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pellman, I, I am intrigued by your testimony and hope that when we're done we can spend some time to talk about some things. I am intrigued by um, the notion or your assertion early in your statement that there is a lack of studies in the area and maybe you could clarify that because I think Dr. Brower uh, might have an issue with that and I'll let you clarify first and then I'm going to ask Dr. Brower if he would agree with you. Well first I'm talking as a physician and a scientist it is very difficult to do studies on anabolic steroids in terms of if you go and you look at publications on ana anabolic steroids when we talk about the risk of cancer or liver disease or heart disease. It is very hard to do analysis on those patients because how in fact do you give them anabolic steroids and study them and test them the but way you, most you, validated you scientific studies are done. This, you don't refute the notion that anabolic steroids need to be banned in baseball, need to be banned in general society. You are not uh, casting aspersions on the idea that this is a substance that's no worse than anything else out there, are you? In fact, just the opposite. I'm saying that despite the fact that there are no strong scientific studies that support those conclusions, I in fact absolutely concur 
regarding the potential health risks and the fact that it should be banned. You make reference in your testimony to THG. Uh, the designer steroid. You know we banned that last year, um, along with uh, along with precursors like Andro. Uh, I, I need to mention to the parents. I, I don't have your experience. Thank God, I'm very lucky. But I got in this business because my teenage son wanted to take Andro because he heard Mark McGuire took Andro. Lake Placid happens to be in my district. I happen to have access to some scientists who who believe there is uh, emphatic data out there. And that's how I got started on this, and I was lucky, and, and I thank God for that. Uh, you make reference to THG, Dr. Pellman, the designer steroid that's the center of the Balco investigation. Several uh, baseball players um, may have used THG for years before its detection by authorities was really even uh, capable. Um, and its addition to the list of federal controlled substance was, was, was perfected, as I said, last year. Under the new policy, does baseball currently list designer steroids like THG and, and the precursors like Andro? Well, first, policy? the answer is in terms of precursors, absolutely yes. And I will get to THG in one question. But in fact, if I may, I would like to ask a question as well. What is interesting to us, and in fact, I suspect uh, the other physicians on this panel as well, is how why not all precursors were banned? Why was DHEA not banned, in fact, when the new laws were passed? In effect, I have very strong feelings about that and, in fact, spoke to one of the senators regarding this, uh, a key actually, member. But, get, but I, want, I don't want to filibuster because I have other questions, but it's a good point and I actually agree but, with you on that issue. But when we talk about, but when we talk about pro-hormones and we talk about the That's exclusion it. of pro-hormones, DHEA was excluded but yes, pro-hormones are covered. And regarding THG, yes, designer steroids are covered. It is impossible to list steroids that you can't identify, but the intentions, and I suspect that Rob Manford will adjust this later on, was in fact THG was added on, and the intention is that all, any, any designer steroid that is identified will be added on to that list. Thank the chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Waxman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to say to the Garibaldis and Mr. Hooten, thank you very much for being here. I, it, I know it's very painful for you to have to relive the awful experience, but this is a, it's a powerful message for everyone to get from this hearing, and I thank you for being here. Dr. Wadler, I, I want to ask uh, you, because you are a world expert in, in the use and detection of performance-enhancing drugs, you have a senior advisory position with the World Anti-Doping Agency, and that oversees the Olympic uh, testing and is considered the international gold standard in preserving integrity in sports. Have you had a, you've had a chance to look at the Major League uh, Baseball's new 2005 drug, drug <coughs> testing policy. I've had a chance to look it over, not study it in detail. Okay. Am I, Mr. Chairman, by the Mr. ranking member? I'm not paid by the World Anti-Doping Agency, by the way. I'm a volunteer. Okay. Um, I'd like to run down a few key provisions of baseball's policy and ask for your professional opinion. Does the policy cover all anabolic steroids? Uh, no. Uh, does the policy address the misuse of human growth hormone? Inadequate in terms of testing. Okay. Uh, does the policy cover other important performance enhancing drugs that have similar effects as anabolic steroids and human growth hormone? No, they do not. For example, IGF-1, insulin, Two examples, human chorionic and anatrophin. There's a number of them that do not. Okay. Does the policy cover stimulants? Uh, except for ephedra, I believe, it does not deal with the broad category of stimulants, including amphetamines. Does the policy assure integrity in the testing process? Uh, as I've read it, there are significant loopholes in the program as outlined. Uh, does the policy permit new types of substances to be tested for as uh, new problems are identified? It's not quite clear how that winds its way onto the list. Uh, I'm not quite certain what you're, what you're driving at, though, with that. Does the policy adequately inform athletes of what are banned substances and masking agents? Well, it's not te they don't test for masking agents, by the way. They don't test for diuretics, uh, which are critical in uh, detecting uh, abuse. Uh, I'm not sure of how much of the educational part uh, the program it deals with. I didn't address that specifically. Does the policy uh, contain adequate penalties? 
Uh, categorically, in my view, not. And, what, and then let me ask you this. Will this new policy remove the cloud that has been hanging over baseball? Unfortunately, I think it increased the cloud. Uh, Dr. Wadler, uh, Dr. Pellman just made the statement that I thought was really quite uh, interesting, if it's true, and that is a number of legal dietary supplements are laced with banned substances, which is not known to the player, and would come up with false positives. Has this been a problem in, uh, in, in the Olympics or in other testing programs? Yes, uh, he's absolutely correct about that. That was a major issue for several years around the world. A, vast, a very large percentage of positive tests were related to the ingestion of the so-called precursors, andro-type drugs. Uh, there was a lot of adjudication around that. Uh, the United States was seen as somebody who actually facilitated that and from perspectives around the world. I'm happy to see that loophole has been closed, uh, but it did account for a lot of positive tests and the adjudication took that into account when athletes made their cases around the world. So you disagree with uh, Dr. Pellman when he claims this is a problem in the testing program? I think it was a problem. I don't think it's a problem anymore. Okay. Uh, May I respond to yes. some of the comments that Dr. Wadler just said, including the fact that my suggestion is, is that before you comment on something for the record, that you do more than glance at it, but you study it. And in fact... Uh, Dr. Pellman, I only have a few minutes. And if you want to respond to that last point on testing, because he challenged your statement and I attributed yes, it. Yes, and I'm getting there. Well, that in fact, that me, substances the, like diuretics are tested for that masking agents are tested for, that in fact, from the letter that I saw from this body, four steroids were listed as being out of the list in which that will be disputed later on. Well, Dr. Pellman, I've, uh, my staff's had a chance to review M uh, National, National Baseball League's uh, policy, and there's no list of specific masking agents or diuretics in this policy, contrary to the public assurances of Major League Baseball. It's not in the documents that were submitted to us. I want to ask Dr. Wadler, because I only have another few uh, seconds. Uh, you suggested that the uh, uh, Olympic testing program is the right way to approach the Olympics, which happens every four years, and it's the wrong approach to sports like bas baseball with long seasons. Can you give us some examples of other sports that have adopted the Olympic testing program and could the standard be applied to baseball and other sports at different levels? Uh, professional tennis. I actually adjudicated a case just yesterday morning in a professional tennis player. Uh, it may not be as big in this country as in other parts of the world, but professional soccer around the world, a huge money sport, is, is uh, signatory to the, the uh, World Anti-Doping Code. Uh, as is cycling, which is a huge money sport. Uh, rugby may be less of an interest in this country, but there are at least four professional sports around the world which are not in the Olympic movement, which are using this as their standard. Could baseball, could it apply to baseball? Could it apply to baseball? Could it be Absolutely. made to work? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to agree with my uh, colleague, Mr. Sweeney, when he said this is the most powerful panel we're probably going to hear from today. And I say that because, uh, personally, I wasn't quite certain whether or not we were, this was something that Congress should be getting involved in. I, I, uh, uh, I wasn't quite sure. In fact, I, I just want to read you one little quick thing. How, uh, this is today's Detroit News, my, my big paper in my area. In my district, I had a lot of people calling saying, what are you doing? This is what the Detroit News opined today. They said, Congress strikes out with steroid hearings. A federal grand jury has already exposed a problem, and the teen use of performance enhancing drugs is declining. That's what my Detroit News is saying. And I, I read that this morning. I thought, well, I don't know about this hearing, but I'm going to tell you after listening to you, you parents in particular, and my heart goes out to you, I feel absolutely convinced that we are doing the right thing. With this, I want to uh, applaud the uh, chairman and the ranking member for calling this hearing. And I personally intend to write a uh, opinion editorial to the Detroit News. I'm, I may lift some of your statements, if you don't mind, because it was very powerful, uh, very powerful. And Mr. Hooten, in particular, when you said that your son's coach said to your son that he needed to get bigger, he essentially told your son, I don't want to put words in a coach's mouth, but what was he implying to your son? He was implying to your son essentially that Taylor should be using steroids. I, I, I would have that question and then to the uh, Garibaldi's as well. 
Um, so sorry for the loss of your son, of course. But you said that in your testimony, I was writing that he was advised to obtain steroids. I'm just wondering who actually advised him to do so. Again, was it a coach? Was it a, a scout? Uh, it's just very, uh, it was just amazing to me listening to that. So I, I have those questions. That statement comes from Rob himself. When we were trying to figure out what was going on with the steroid use, he said he was advised and, and actually had it had been obtained for him at the University of Southern California. He did not name names. However, since he's passed away, we have learned that his initial course of steroids he did on his own going across to Tijuana. So we have no fact if the University of Southern California was involved. What we're concerned about <laughs> is that we believe they're still implicated because Rob was ill showed symptoms for months and nothing was done. It took a mother from, a, uh, from his roommate to call us and say something is terribly wrong and you've got to get down here. So the, the <coughs> coaches, staff at USC did nothing to help our son. Did USC actually have a testing program set up? Did they have any type of a program set up to test? It is, it is set up, but basically it's only during the season. Rob began suffering the withdrawals during the season and had taken the steroids in the fall. I see. In our case, uh, first of all, it was Taylor with his psychiatrist that told his psychiatrist that the reason he got started was because of the advice the coach had given him to get bigger. Now, I want to make in this particular case no inference, because I don't know that, that the coach had steroids in mind. Rather, what I would like to, us to all learn from this is that that's the reason I think our coaches need to be trained and certified because this particular coach hasn't been trained in how to show this kid how to get on a diet or exercise program to show him how to gain 20 pounds. And you turn a 16-year-old kid loose with an objective of trying to, to gain 20 pounds when he's got half of his teammates doing steroids, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what path he's going to take if left to his own devices. Uh, it, but this is going on with coaches around the country. They need to be trained, but they need to be held accountable to see that this doesn't happen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummings. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, first of all, I want to thank the Giobaldis and the Mr. Hooten. I want to thank you for being here. Um, as a father, uh, I can truly relate to how you must feel. Um, and I can only say that hopefully, first of all, I, th I thank you for taking your pain and trying to turn it into something positive so that somebody else might be helped and so that other young people might not go through what your sons have gone through. And I was just wondering what it is that you would like for baseball players to do to help get the word out. In other words, to help as opposed to hurting the process. Well, we've got an organization that's formed uh, to tackle this. The Garibaldis are involved in the Moreros. It would be wonderful if coming out of these hearings after the dust settles, if we haven't some made them so mad they won't talk to us again, that they would get behind an organization like ours or the programs that we're working on and become a part of solving actively this problem with the kids. Not just doing training in the locker rooms at Major League Baseball, but doing training in the locker rooms in our high schools across the country with the big league players, with the big names standing there helping us deliver that message. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, it's, not only, it's not only the players. Major League Baseball scouts have a big influence on the young, young kids of this country. Their network of scouts evaluates every kid playing baseball in high school in this country. Their, their stats, their, everything, all their statistics are all there. This is where it starts. Major League Baseball in 1988, the average size player was 188 pounds. Today it's 220 pounds. These scouts indirectly talk to every high school coach, college coach, and get the point across to a kid who's a prospect exactly what they need to do to meet the profile that they desire. So they have an influence on our high school kids from the time they're 14, 15 years old. And 
what they say and how they deal with it is a problem. Thank you. Dr. Weiler, let me ask you this. Uh, you said that there were loopholes in the policy as you know it, the uh, National Baseball League's uh, policy. Let me ask you this. Um, if a player cannot urinate in an adequate amount, um, there is a it, there's a rule apparently that says if a play, if, if an inadequate amount of urine is collected less than uh, 75 uh, milliliters, discard the specimen in the player's presence. Instruct the player that he should return in an hour to attempt another collection. Do you see that as a problem? Player has to be escorted from the moment they are notified. They can never be left. They must be chaperoned until an adequate uh, specimen is supplied so they can be certified. It's the player's union, and there was no opportunity for tampering or any other mischievous behavior. Why? So, so in other words, the coming back in an hour, there's a problem that happens there? In other words, if they come back, you're saying there can be some, in other words, the body is still the same, is it not? Well, I don't want to get graphic, but there are a number of things that athletes have been known to do that to deceive the collection of urine. All right, so you so said... You don't, want to leave, you don't want to leave them alone, unattended, until you have that specimen from the moment they're notified until you have it uh, sealed. Would you consider that a major loophole? I consider it a loophole. Okay. Dr. Perlman, are you you're the medical advisor to the commissioner? Can you talk, can explain that, why that is allowed? No, I cannot, but I agree with Dr. Wadler that, in fact, that person should be observed for that hour. Well, did you, were you aware of that policy? In terms of, in terms of that component? Yes. No. You, you mean you're the, you're the commissioner's, you mean you're the advisor on these kinds of issues and you didn't even know that a person could walk away, not be observed? Is that what you're telling me well, during a test? The answer to that, Congressman, is yes. But on the other hand, I would tell you that in terms of the development of this program, which was brand new, if that's the worst of my problems as we move forward and make changes, I would say that we've done a pretty good job. That if you tell me, in fact, that that is the loophole there that stands alone, I will make sure that that gets changed. If you tell so you're me, telling me today, my time is up, but you're telling me today that you're going to go back to baseball and say, make sure you do this as their advisor. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Westmoreland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to thank uh, the Garibaldis and Mr. Hooten and uh, Miranda's that, for y'all's loss. And, um, but my question, I guess, the first one is for Mr. Pellman. Now, Mr. Pellman, you are the advisor to Commissioner of Major League Baseball. Is that correct? Yes, I am. So if he had asked you if what the results of steroid use was, would you have answered him that there was a serious lack of scientific studies as to what it did? Well, first, I think we need to separate that out between I am and have published and do publish. And therefore, when I say things that are for the record, that is for the record, and I talk as a I, scientist. I understand, but... So I, therefore, but therefore, my response to that is, I would have told the commissioner that there are severe consequences, medical consequences, from taking anabolic steroids. However, do I have the literature that can be pulled to make my case in front of other scientists in terms of certain health risks that we assume? The answer is no. But would your answer it would have been to him that there's no serious studies as to what the effects of the use of steroids are? Again, it, it depends upon how you define studies. In terms of when we talk about doing perspective analysis, and we talk about doing trial studies on drug studies, we take two groups of patients. We take patients and put them on a drug. We took patients that are not that presume they're on the drug but may not be, and then we put them on something else, and then we follow that. You cannot do that humanistically when it comes to anabolic steroids. So therefore, the data that we look at is called retrospective. We pull data out, for example, with East German swimmers and others that have allegedly taken steroids. But the consensus, again, is, and my opinion strongly stated, is that anabolic steroids are 
unequivocally unhealthy for you and can lead to severe consequences, including death. But you didn't get that from reading studies about it. It depends, again, in terms of defining studies. Yes, there are studies out there, but again, okay. we are talking let's about... On, let's go on to the next question. And you also say that the, the most common reason for a positive test is the contamination. No, I said that in my experience in the National Football League, one of the more common, pro the, besides taking it and cheating it, the most common reason for being tested positive for anabolic steroids is in fact, at least allegedly, taking a dietary supplement that contains a banned substance. So in other words, I could be taking a dietary supplement right now and be taking some controlled substance. The, in fact, there is no doubt about it. And in fact, it's one of the travesties of the dietary supplement industry right now. And could one it, of the things it, that... Could it be caused from carrying them in the same bottle? No, often it could be, of course it could be, but it also could be because it's contaminated and in fact if you take a dietary supplement that does not contain a banned substance, it won't do anything for you, so therefore it increases their own marketing. So if the commissioner asks you about the penalties imposed, just getting your expert opinion, you, then you would have said that from your experience with the NFL that this contamination, unknowing to this athlete, caused most of the positive drug testing would could cause some of it, if not many, of the positive drug tests, yes. And Dr. Uh, Brower, can I ask you a question? Uh, you know, lately in sports, we've seen basketball teams run up into the stands. We've seen baseball teams jump over bleachers and dugouts to get to fans. Uh, uh, it, it, could this be a sign of some type of steroid use? Uh, I'm not accusing of anybody, but I mean, is this the typical behavior? Uh, because it seems that more and more of this is happening in sports today uh, that we witness. And uh, I know there's a lot of pressure from being a professional athlete, but could steroid use uh, help this along? I, I'm not in a position to say for any given player whether they have used or not. Um, I certainly have not examined these players, and I haven't seen their urine tests. Um, it's also the case that these professional sports are going to attract a, uh, athletes who are competitive and who um, have to be aggressive in order to be successful at their sport. So um, steroids, yes, may be involved, but I cannot say for sure. Can I interject a comment, though, about the issue of the science? Because I, I wanted to take a, a, a point there. Effectively, though, we cannot do studies where we can give uh, steroids to a normal controlled population and compare it with those that don't get it. What we can do is studies in laboratory animals, and what these studies have shown unequivocally is that steroids do affect a wide variety of parameters that include your own physiology as well as behavior. And there is clear evidence, there are multiple studies in animals showing that if you give these anabolic steroids, animals are more aggressive. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, because there are no Democrats presently here, we will go to the Republican side and make it up when they come back. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think there could be anybody who heard the testimony of the Garibaldis or the Hootens and not be moved. And I particularly wanted to ask uh, Mr. Hooten if the baseball stars had spoken out against steroids and performance enhancement drugs, do you think your son Taylor might be alive today? Yes, I do. do you if, think, if, I wondered if, if you thought Rob might be alive today also. Uh, without a doubt. Absolutely. Because they were their heroes? Well, so much so that he would videotape his heroes and break down, break down uh, frame by frame and try to emulate uh, their swings. And I mean, he was a student of the game, most definitely. This is so different than the other drugs we deal with, where many times the drug dealers and the pushers are not heroes, and it's a different set of problems. But here, professional baseball has a whole different set of responsibilities because it's, it's different than heroin and cocaine. I also wanted to ask Dr. Volkall, and I want to thank you again for coming in front of our committee. You've been a, a, often a witness in front of our narcotics committee. Um, you gave, just gave some additional testimony on uh, what we can know from at least laboratory animals and it's hard to get human tests. But one of the critical things in baseball here is not just strength and aggression, but do you believe and have, are any tests 
uh, have occurred, whether it would impact hand-to-eye coordination, because that would be very critical as far as how it might impact a game. So, sorry, in my, my knowledge, I'm not aware specifically of studies that have evaluated the effects of anabolic steroids on eye motor coordination. I am aware of studies that have evaluated the effects of these anabolic steroids on cognitive performance, but not specifically on motor coordinations. Most of the studies have evaluated their effects on strength and endurance. If, if, uh, if it increased your aggression or uh, your heart rate, would that impact potentially motor skills and how quick you could react as well as how powerful you would react? Uh, definitely, and what we do know, for example, is that aggression um, is in part related to the activation of an area that we call the amygdala. And when the amygdala gets activated, the frontal cortex gets deactivated, and that's why I always say to my staff, please do not comment if you're angry because your cognitive abilities are not going to be as sharp. So yes, indeed, if you are very, very angry, your ability to do the right thing and make proper decisions is going to be markedly, markedly impaired. But not necessarily on a baseball that's coming at you, the aggressive, uh, the, the increased aggression and increased enhanced um, uh, hyperactivity might in fact short term result in you being able to hit the ball harder or quicker. Yeah. The extent to which you can dissociate the effects of a steroid performance in the baseball, where, where the, many of the issues are very controlled as opposed to outside, where you don't know if a car is going to, to get inside you, is very different. So in the baseball field, to my knowledge, there is no, and this is clearly not scientific because there's no scientific studies done on, on, a, on a game. There's no evidence in my view that that per se affects the performance of the player itself in the game. Dr. Brower, you made some references on medical things. Have you ever, uh, do you know of anything that might suggest that or uh, whether it might impact that ability? Um, what, what I can say is that steroids do work, otherwise athletes wouldn't take them. There are studies not necessarily looking at specific uh, coordination issues, but there are studies looking at development of muscle mass and muscle strength and those studies are fairly conclusive that anabolic steroids can increase muscle mass and muscle strength. Is that going to be an advantage to every athlete? Maybe not, but to many athletes it will. Steroids will not turn me into a baseball player, but if I was a baseball player, they could give me an edge. Do, um, Dr. Volkow, I'd like to ask you another question. Our, our fastest growing and, and uh, most difficult law enforcement problem in the United States is, is meth. And we have many uh, proposals both here in Congress and at different state levels to regulate pseudoephedrine, which would be a manufactured form of ephedra. Could you talk about what similarities ephedra would have to pseudoephedrine, which is the key for meth? The, the, and the question here relates to, uh, to stimulant drugs, ephedrine and pseudoephedrine, and amphetamine and methamphetamine. All of these drugs share a similar pharmacological effect, and that is they increase uh, the concentration of a chemical called dopamine that allows you actually to perform faster. They also gives you a sense of energy. Um, they vary in terms of their potency. So some of these drugs are mo more potent in able to do this. Among the most potent is, of course, methamphetamine, and that's why it results in such a severe addiction. So it, it's a rather problematic when we're trying to send a message about crystal meth around the United States when Major League Baseball wouldn't even address ephedra, which has been illegal now for several years. Even yes, though and, a, even and though it's a lighter dose, uh, quite frankly, methamphetamines come in, in uh, crystal meth even can come in lighter doses and heavier doses and result in faster addiction, uh, longer term impacts. Uh, Ephedra would be, in effect, what you're telling me, very similar to a lighter impact of pseudoephedrine, which is the key part of crystal meth. Correct. Uh, those, I mean, it's not the right message to send that one drug is bad and the other one is acceptable. And I think that's one of the reasons why we lose so much credibility in our education prevention campaigns. Um, at, at the same time, we need to recognize that not all of the drugs are the same. 
and there are some that are more dangerous. Definitely amphetamines are drugs that are dangerous and definitely produce addiction. There's no question about it. And so should we be sending the message that ephedrine versus pseudoephedrine is okay? okay? No, we shouldn't. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, okay. Uh, Oh, uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Marchin for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hooten, I think uh, most of my comments and questions will be directed to you. I'm a, a neighbor. I live in Coppell. So, uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So uh, let me say, first of all, I'm sorry for your tragedy. I uh, appreciate all of your effort today uh, in appearing before this, this panel. As you have been reading the newspaper in our area in the last two or three months, the district that I represent is uh, South Lake Colleyville, Grapevine, and Coppell in that area. We probably have uh, several dozen professional athletes that live in our communities that play for the Rangers, the Stars, the Mavericks, and the uh, Cowboys practice there in Irving. So. Uh, these professional athletes are very, very important people in our community. They're very involved in our community. But the message that uh, I'm most concerned about today is the message that uh, Major League Baseball is sending to the student athletes in, in my district. Uh, we have, uh, we're the home of South Lake. Uh, the Would the gentleman pull the mic a little closer, please? We're, we're the home of South Lake, the best football team, Haskell football team in America, it said. And, but we're seeing a disturbing trend in our high schools where uh, steroids are not only um, being used, but are, I think are being encouraged to be used, uh, both among the athletes themselves. And I, I, I believe some, from some of the comments that we have read in the newspaper, from some, even the parents. Yes. What do you think Major League Baseball uh, could do? What kind of practical things do you think Major League Baseball could do to begin to communicate directly to those student athletes? Two things. One was the message I delivered today, which is taking serious steps to clean up their act, to make sure it's not just training and all of the good words in the pablum, but they, that we implement meaningful programs. As far as the kids go, the, the horses are already out of the barn and we've got to figure out how to get them back in there. And I meant what I said a second ago. I think a great role that, that, that the Major League Baseball could play is, is in the Trainers Association and in the, you know, the other significant players within the league could come with us or by themselves, however we implement the program, to go into the schools with us to, to, to deliver the message to the coaches, but most importantly to the kids that, that this stuff is not acceptable that, and that it's, it's not being tolerated and to try to turn, try to turn this thing around. And as a parent, what, um, what would you say to parents out there that are, that are listening today and, and beginning to wonder whether their, their student athlete is involved in this? And what kind of questions would you, would you say to a parent you can ask? And, and what, are, what are some of the signs that my parents that I represent would Outstanding question. You know, number one, recognize the use of this stuff is as high as it is and don't assume that your son or daughter, we haven't talked about the girls in here today, that your son or daughter is somehow immune from, 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 from being in this thing. Second, you need to read for yourself what the signs are of steroid abuse. Hindsight is 2020. In hindsight, all of the signs that would have told us that Taylor was doing steroids were right there in front of us. He put on about 30 pounds of, uh, of weight in his upper body. He had acne on his back, uh, a puffy skin, or excuse me, puffy face, puffy neck, oily skin. Uh, he was going through what seemed to be gallons of mouthwash. Bad breath is another uh, sign. Uh, he was beginning to grow nipples. Boys on steroids begin to grow breasts. Taking any of those individually, Nobody thinks anything about them, but you put them all together and you combine them with aggressive behavior of the type that the Garibaldi's experienced and we experienced and the Marrero's expenses experienced, you got a steroid user in your house. And all of the signs were right there in front of us, but parents across America, like us, 
have no idea what we're looking at. And it's right there in our face. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I give my time back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, it's now my privilege to introduce uh, the member from California, Mr. Lantos, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, let me first say my heart goes out to the parents. As the grandparent of 17, I know exactly your loss. We are deeply grateful for your presence. I'd like to step back for a moment from baseball and to put this hearing into a broader perspective. Because in many ways, what we are dealing with is the problem of a society that provides mind-boggling opportunities to some individuals uh, with uh, obscenely excessive rewards. And these individuals, whether they are corporate crooks, CEOs who eventually go to prison, domestic divas like Martha Stewart, who spent some time behind bars, or people viewed as role models, uh, considering themselves somehow not bound by the laws of society that apply to the rest of us. And in many ways, this hearing is also reminiscent of the tobacco hearings we, we held in this body, a very profitable industry which has grown very arrogant and is unprepared to play by the rules. The first uh, inkling we got was that we had no authority, no jurisdiction to deal with this issue. Well, baseball is not on the moon. It is subject to the oversight authority of the Congress. Secondly, I think it's sort of intriguing listening to our physicians and scientists that unless one is unbelievably naive, it's self-evident that baseball's uh, new policy is designed to silence the critics and not to solve the problem. Uh, I found um, your testimony, Dr. Pellman, pathetically unpersuasive. And I think you dramatically underrate the intelligence of this panel uh, in presenting the arguments you have, shifting the blame to other entities, the federal government, other sports are more guilty than we are. That simply will not wash. What I would like to ask uh, Dr. Wadler, and I was very much impressed by your testimony, sir. Um, is there any earthly reason why in the face of tragedies such as the ones presented here today and untold numbers of others, we should not have penalties which in fact work? Our distinguished colleague, the first witness, former baseball star, said, the industry is taking baby steps. When, when, when young men are dying and tens of thousands of children or hundreds of thousands are involved, baby steps are not enough. We need to have, since self-regulation palpably has not worked, we need to have provisions enacted into law that will work. And while we have had some discussion of the Olympic rules, I would be grateful if you would comment on the applicability of the Olympic rules with proper changes for baseball. Uh, thank you, uh, certainly. Uh, there's a number of issues uh, at hand here. We haven't talked about governance, for example, uh, inherent conflicts of interest. What I think is needed is an independent, transparent, accountable system. What you're referring to as the Olympic Movement uh, Code is no longer the Olympic Movement Code, it's the World Code. Uh, the United States is part of that and has taken a leadership position in it. Its applicability is not only to Olympic sports, it's to sports worldwide. It really is the gold standard. It is neutral. It takes no bias whatsoever. Uh, to me, it is un absolutely incomprehensible that that code should not be adopted with, with slight modifications, perhaps, in its entirety by all sport. 
This is an incredibly complex business. It's physiology, chemistry, therapeutics, psychiatry, law, ethics, education, uh, and so on. It is, I, the budget alone of the World Anti-Doping Agency is $20 million a year. To think the HPAC, the Health Policy Advisory Committee, uh, a body of four, can substitute for the collective wisdom of the world makes no sense to me. So it's, I think it's time to move forward. As I suggested in my remarks, I suspect the biggest concern of baseball is the sanctions, because the mandatory two-year sanctions for steroid abuse under the code. Uh, I understand that. But clearly, even the National Football League comes very close to that code, and they have at least some teeth in their sanctions of four-game suspensions a quarter of a, of a season. But the bottom line is, my feeling is, all sport should get out of the drug business. They should leave it to the people who are experts in the drug business and go on about running their sports. This has gotten far too complicated and far too expensive for them to deal it on their own. So I think the day has come to move this agenda forward to say that all sports should adopt that and use that as their gold standard, and the sporting bodies themselves should get out of the drug business, period. Thank you. Thank you, and I fully agree with you, sir. Thank you, Th Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Mr. Lantos. Mr. Kanjorski, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I, I was struck today by the testimony that I think we'd all concedes, uh, concede that the use of steroids are extremely disadvantaged personally, and certainly the tragedies that we heard are recognized there. But I'm awfully struck by the fact that, and maybe I, I'm unfamiliar with the question, who manufactures these steroids? Who profits from them? Is that the driving motivation or is it something else? Is it attainment of success, which obviously in professional sports uh, uh, that's there, but uh, does any member of the panel know whether they're manufactured in the United States? Are they manufactured in garages? Are they manufactured in sophisticated laboratories? In working with the uh, very closely over time with the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, several of the agents have told me that the stuff the kids are buying, now, that's another whole subject, the stuff our kids are buying is very different than what the professional athletes are taking. Steroids are not all the same. Mm -hmm. The stuff that's coming in illegally, from what I've been told, is in excess of 80 percent is coming across the border from south of us, from Mexico. Uh, from a quality standpoint, uh, at best, this stuff is veterinary grade. It's another whole subject. What our kids are getting was designed, at best, for use in horses and pigs and cattle. That's what our kids are taking. It's not the stuff the big boys are taking where, where they're spending where all... Are the, where are the big boys getting theirs? I don't know. Yes, doctor. I just think it's... Excuse me, I think it's important to understand, at another level, this is about drug dealing. It's another form of pervasive drug dealing. It has a different cachet than heroin, cocaine, and marijuana. Some of it is diverted from legitimate sources. Some of it is clandestinely manufactured. Some of it comes across the border, others through the Internet. Okay, let me, let me ask this question. What volume of the production of steroids are for illegal or improper use? Do you have any studies on that? I, 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 I missed, your, missed your question, sir. You want to repeat that, please? What, what percentage of the production of steroids are being uh, used uh, illegally, improperly? In other words, do we have a large volume? Should, uh, can, uh, the question I'm asking is, why can't we look at the inventory of production and realize that people that are making these things know that they're going for illicit purposes? Well, I, I can only answer in general terms, but there's no question that the legitimate use of these substances has dropped dramatically in recent years as other drugs have replaced them. So the legitimate marketplace for it has shrunk substantially. Uh, well, what is the production? Is that shrunk too? I, you'd have to ask the DEA. Well, I don't, I don't yeah. have that information. What I'm really struck with is we don't have any manufacturer on the panel. We have no doctor on the panel. How, you know, this isn't happening in a void. Who's, do, who, who's making the delivery system? Who's making the production of these things? You know, I, I, I will relate for the panel and for the record. I just went over to vote, and a, and a member of Congress told me that in 1967, he used steroids at the, uh, on the advice of his coach. 
and they were animal grade steroids. And the only reason he stopped it was his father was a cattle rancher and told him he's losing too many cattle out there in the range and these things probably aren't good for you. But where is the medical profession? Where is the pharmaceutical manufacturing profession? Why aren't they here? Well, I'm here. <laughs> I, 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 think that's not, I think that's another question that appropriately well, Doctor, is directed at the DEA. Not at this, this hearing is set up that we're going to talk about handling this on the retail basis. I mean, that's what we're all talking about. What kind of studies, what more labs do we need, how much more tests. And the reality, it seems to me, is that it, it's clear it's being used to some percentage in professional sports. That's not acceptable. But how are we going to get down to its broad use at the lower levels and get control if we don't find something? Now, so one question that I would like to know, is there a footprint that you can identify after you test where the source of the, of the drug came from? Uh, generally not, although as uh, Mr. Hooten just alluded to, we know even in baseball's own statistics, uh, equipoise, which is a veterinary drug, uh, accounted for five of the 96 tests uh, stanazolol, which is on here, comes is a, a, a it's called Winstrol, and there's a Winstrol V, which is a veterinary drug. Clembuterol, which is not a steroid, which is on here, is also used in animals. So some of this is actually coming out of the veterinary world, not the human medicine world. Well, well can't we require in our licensing and manufacture process that a footprint be entered into the drug that would be traceable after testing? So we would know what companies or what individuals knowingly are profiting from the manufacture and sale of these illicit That's a very good question. But actually, a number of years ago, on EPO, which is another abused drug in other sports, endurance sports, we had met uh, with Amgen to put a marker on the EPO. Right. Uh, but the feeling was that it would cause such other issues in terms of approvals, going through drug approvals and so on, that considering the extent of abuse relative to use, that was dropped. And I'm not aware of any marker that exists in any of these products. But we would have the physical capacity to put a marker in. The gentleman's time is up. Uh, that's probably beyond my uh, expertise. Uh, and I want to uh, I'm sorry, but the, the generals, we've well, well, gone we quite a bit over. We'll come back with a second round if necessary. Can we take a response to that? Okay, without objection. Yeah, yeah my, the other aspect that makes it very difficult to do what you are doing is that unfortunate access to drugs now through websites. So actually, you get drugs that are not just manufactured from the United States, from, from abroad. Moreover, if you go into the web, go Google and put uh, anabolic steroids, no prescription. You'll get hundreds of thousands of, of hits. So you can now go as an adolescent in the sort of privacy of your own home and order these things through the web delivered to you. Now, you will not know the quality. You will not know where they come from, which, of course, is very risky, but there's no regulation. So that makes it very, very problematic. I'd like to say that the vials that I found in Rob's bedroom after he died were not marked. There would be no way to trace them. The vials that were found in Taylor's bedroom uh, all had Spanish writing on them. If you type on, on your computer, buy steroids, you will come up with thousands of sites. Over a million. Uh, uh yeah, well, we the gentleman's time has expired. We, we will come back on, on the next question. The gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Goodnick. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, uh, I was very interested in this line of questioning because, you know, we have, uh, we have this ongoing battle right now with the FDA and a lot of folks in my home state of Minnesota where people are buying legal drugs from Canada and are facing just, you know, a blizzard of, uh, of criticism from the FDA. In fact, they're actually intercepting a lot of the drugs now and, and sending them back. And yet, what I'm hearing here is uh, these, this particular class of drugs, which are clearly dangerous, clearly illegal, and we don't see much enforcement by our own FDA. Is that what you're saying? What I'm suggesting is the law enforcement folks that I've talked to, both at the local, state, as well as the enforcement guys from the DEA, will all tell you the same thing. They don't get as many points for, for picking up a steroid dealer as they do for picking up somebody on coke or heroin. It's, it's not in the same classification as the harder drugs. So the reality is when you can talk to them privately and understand what's really going on, the officer in Plano, Texas that handled our cases you know, Mr. Hooten, if this wasn't such a high-profile case, we wouldn't even be following up on it. 
steroids are not considered, it's a whole nother can of worms, we get it. they're not considered hardcore drugs. I think we've learned today they are. And for whatever the rules are on the penalties that go along with the drugs, they don't incent our law enforcement agencies to deal with them. Now, that's a general statement, but I believe it's very accurate. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, there was an uh, unintended consequence of the Controlled Substances Act of 1990 in anabolic steroids in terms of the sentencing guidelines, but those have been rectified with the recent enactment of the Anabolic Steroid Act of 2004. But the U.S. attorneys sort well, of were de-incentivized to pursue those cases. Could you explain what you mean by rectified? Apparently the sentencing guidelines provide for uh, a high degree of sentencing depending on amounts and so on, there's a, I'm not, you know, I'm not in that area, but I was sufficiently involved with several cases years ago for the, with the Justice Department, that became obvious, and there was actually a review, uh, I think it was under the DEA, as the consequences of the sentencing guidelines uh, a couple of years ago, and U.S. attorneys from around the country had recognized that the sentencing guidelines were sort of de-incentivized de how they use their budgets in prosecuting cases. But I believe, and I don't have to, it's not my area of expertise, but I believe it was rectified in the Anabolic uh, Steroid Act that went into effect last month. So there may be a greater prosecutions. Mr. Chairman, I, I would hope that at some time we, we would try to get some folks in from FDA and the DEA and, and try to get to the bottom of why it is we, we treat one classification of potentially dangerous drugs so leniently, and yet we're going after seniors who are trying to save 50 bucks on their Zocor. Uh, it, it seems to me that that's uh, a misallocation of, of, uh, of resources and, and, and the wrong way to ultimately deal with these kinds of problems. I yield back to balance my time. The gentleman yields back. Who seeks record? Uh, gentleman, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Garibaldi and, and Hooten families for coming. And uh, please know that our prayers are with your families and, and your sons. Um, and we regret very greatly that this, this has happened. Um, I, I want to turn my questions to principally to Dr. Wadler and, and also Dr. Pellman. Uh, it seems we're in a cat and mouse game here uh, where uh, a substance is listed as a prohibited substance in the, in the uh, Major League Baseball drug policy. Mr. Dr. Pellman, did you help draft this? Are you, are you part of this? No, okay. Uh, it seems that we have a listing here and if, if the chemical on the list, if the steroid on the list is, is uh, laid out in the contract and a player uses it, it's illegal and, and they can be penalized on its face. However, uh, if there's an alteration, if there's a slight modification, chemical modification, a molecular uh, modification to any of these substances, then technically under this contract they're legal. And, and what I'm fearful of is that, um, that it will just be a, a, a cat and mouse game um, as designer steroids become available and players continually shift from listed steroids to unlisted steroids. That's a concern of mine. I do know that the I International Olympic Committee has, has their answer to that problem. And they've adopted language that says any substance listed or any substance of a similar chemical composition that has a similar biological effect on the person taking the chemical, that is also banned as well. So it's sort of like a, a catch-all so that we don't get into this, uh, this very long list of, uh, of, 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 of steroids that has to be added to. And, and by the way, under the policy, under the baseball policy, it has to be by mutual consent by the players' union and by management to add something to the list, which, which is problematic. Uh, I, I'm wondering, you know, Dr. Wadler, if you could, uh, you know, speak to the IOC uh, dimension of this, and perhaps, uh, Dr. Pellman, you could talk to uh, well, the major... Well, major I can certainly baseball. give you a medical perspective. And my answer is, speaking for not only myself, but the other medical people who work for me, is that the intentions is and will be to ban all anabolic steroids. But, that, but I'm, but but you're I'm, asking I'm a, a former question, union attorney, okay? I'm but a former, I am not. I negotiate these collective bargaining agreements, and I'll tell you what. If it's not in the agreement, there's no unwritten agreement here. Then the this, reason we write it down is there's an agreement. Then Congressman and, and, Lynch, and my, then 
the people who defend what's in the contract, this is, ba this is basic rules of contract, if it's not in there, you can't enforce it. Then, Congressman Lynch, I suspect, knowing the schedule today, that you will be able to speak to Mr. Manfred, who did write out the contract and ask him that question. Fair enough. I am unable to answer that That's question. That's okay. Fair enough, Doctor. Fair enough. Dr. Wadler. Uh, yes, this is a living document. Just to tell you the way we deal with this list is that we meet, and I'm a member of the list, what they call the Prohibited List and Methods Committee, because there are methods to enhance performance which are illegal also, not only the, the drugs. We, re we revisit this list uh, several times a year with experts from around the world. We distribute the modifications to the governments of the world, including the United States government, who weigh in on this. And so we constantly have information and we have the flexibility to add to it. We actually have a provision where if there's a sudden new drug that was otherwise uncategorizable, it could be added to the list without waiting for the one-year cycle. Okay. So it's a living process that case, it takes into account what you're suggesting. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Chairman, how am I doing on time? Well, I'd, but would you yield if you... If you uh, if, certainly I'd yield. Well, I just want to point out that, Dr. Pellman, we've had three re loopholes pointed out so far, and we've got ten more. You, uh, you're here at the request of Major League Baseball, but you said you didn't draft this, uh, this testing protocol. Uh, did they consult you about the testing pro protocol? Well, first, in terms of what I said was that the paper was held up and said that I drafted, and my response is, yeah. I am not a lawyer. I am a physician. And my role is, is to give medical advice. And so, therefore, I will answer that question in terms of broad strokes. Okay. Well, let me, I, it's Mr. Lynch's time, but the point I'm making is that we have pointed out three areas where there are loopholes that well, you weren't aware of. And, um, can you define the three for me yes, to the refresh first one my was memory? That some, somebody who was being tested could be gone for an hour and then the, the, yes, that the I am aware specimen of. could be corrupted. The, the second one was the, uh, the, the 10 days uh, suspension could also be a fine or less. You weren't aware of that. Well, I, I, and then I the third one is the one that um, Mr. Lynch was just uh, pointing out that not everything is covered that we th that Congressman thought Congressman Waxman, let me respond to the second one uh, because I've already responded to the first one. And this is for the record. And we talk about drawing up this document. Um, I am, in terms of philosophy, my philosophy has been expressed very strongly to the commissioner and others in the commissioner's office. I stand by, in fact, and as you are well aware, that my thumbprints are all over the NFL's policy as well. And so, therefore, I will look at you and tell you the following, that the intentions of this program is suspension and public notice of that suspension. If that is not adhered to, I will resign. I am aware of the language and not aware of the language before it was published, but I am now. And so, therefore, my understanding from conversations with the Commissioner, from Mr. Dupe and Mr. Manfred, who will clarify that today, that if in fact, in fact, there is a loophole in which a player, and I understand right. in Thank terms you, of the legal I, I document. Think you, I think you made your point, and we will take it up with Mr. Manfred. The other, the other issue I have is uh, this. Gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen's time's expired. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, since I asked Mr. Lynch to yield to me, he was so gracious. Could I ask unanimous consent to be given an additional minute? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're very fair. The last section I want to ask, uh, ask you about is this. We have a provision in this agreement that, uh, that states that in the event of a, an independent government investigation into this drug policy, that it will, it will be null and void. If the government looks into this agreement, into this drug policy and starts investigating whether the enforcement's going on, the monitoring and the penalties are going on, are actually being enforced, then by mutual agreement, it goes away in the face of a government investigation. Dr. Wadler, I mean, you've had experience with a, with a, with a bunch of countries, uh, and uh, have you ever seen a policy like this, uh, a provision like this? And if you have, uh, could you enlighten the, the committee as to what its purpose might be? I have a simple answer. No, I have not. Okay. I have never heard of that. Now, Dr. Pellman, uh, with great trepidation, I'll ask you. I, I know you're saying you didn't draft the document, but perhaps you were advised around some of it. Do you have any information with respect to this, this sort of escape clause that says if, 
if the Government Reform Committee starts looking into this, we're going to treat it as void and we won't, we won't treat the policy as valid. That, that's, that's very troubling here. Mr. Lynch, I, I suspect that you know what my answer will be in terms of, again, being a physician and not a lawyer. Uh, if I knew, I, think I wouldn't have asked. Uh, I think you need another lawyer to respond to that regarding individual rights and protection of constitutional rights. Okay. For me to begin to comment on that would be way beyond the scope of my knowledge. Mr. Lynch, I just want to point out that what the document says is what will be controlling, not what Dr. Pellman intends for it or wishes it would say. And uh, uh, we were told that you had, Dr. Pellman, a very intimate involvement in drafting this document. Uh, if you did, I think the lawyers picked your pocket because what they did is substituted uh, wobbly words so that what you suggested they do, Ms. they didn't even do. You know what I'm finding most fascinating about this, Mr. Waxman, is the following. Is that the intentions in terms of this complicated world we live in, in terms of these drug policies and what we're done, is a fine line between patients and between being a physician and working with lawyers, and in terms of my pocket being picked. I will come back to you and tell you the following. That baseball in its way has made an incredible amount of progress, despite the comments here today. That's what and you've I am responding us. to a personal comment that you made you've to already, me. You've already Mr. Waxman, you've please. Made strides, but we're pointing but out wait. We have and we've talked about the major fact and we have talked about right. the major league system, but we have not talked about the minor league system. And in fact, in terms of the language that was there, I've deferred to Mr. Manford in terms of answering that. So instead of coming to a conclusion about whether or not there was a quarter or a dollar picked from my pocket, I suggest you wait until you get all the information. I, uh, I recommend the same for you before you tell us what's in the document. I did not. You've told me. That's the problem. Thank you. Uh, doctor, I have a question. Uh, some believe that Major League Baseball's policy is weaker than the NFL's. The penalties for violations appear to be, differ significantly. For example, the NFL, the first positive test results in a four-game suspension, which is about, a, I guess, a quarter of a regular season. Major League Baseball's policy stipulates that the penalty for the first offense can either be a 10-day suspension or a $10,000 fine. How do you reconcile the difference? Well, I think I reconcile the difference in terms of the ability, and this will be more of a non-physician response, but a response in terms of dealing with both cultures. Um, dealing with the NFL and dealing with the National Football League in terms of getting medical issues solved is truly a partnership between management and between the Players Association, one of which it is ultimately interesting in terms of parallel lives, in terms of priorities. I will tell you that from my experience, remember I've only been ba with baseball now for about two and a half years, is in fact that there is a difference of philosophy between the Commissioner's Office and the Players Association in terms of the priorities. If you ask me and you look at me and you tell me what would be your wish in terms of the ability to make unilateral decisions regarding the Major League Program, I'll point out the Minor League Program to you because it would have been my intentions that in fact the Minor League Program become the Major League Program. In the Minor League Program, a first suspension is in fact 15 games. Not 15 days, but 15 games. We could argue in terms of how substantial that is in terms of taking a quarter of a season from the NFL, 15 games of minor league baseball, but look at the amount of money and the hardship that those young men experience from being suspended from what they often claim are, is an innocent mistake. Um, however, the program that you have in the mi major league is a negotiation between management and the Players Association. And I will tell you that in terms of my perspective and their perspective, there is a wide, wide schism. Uh, you, uh, I guess, testified uh, that steroids, uh, the testing for anabolic steroids began in the NFL in the league in 1989, correct? I did not testify, but yes, that is correct. Uh, when did testing for anabolic steroids begin in the minor leagues? In the minor leagues, essentially, it started before I started in baseball but became much more rigorous upon my starting and recommendations that were made to the commissioner's office. And, and, and you stated that uh, the difference between baseball and football policies can be attributed to the climate of labor relations uh, no, the, uh, between management and the Players Association. Is there a union in baseball's minor leagues? No, there is not. 
unilateral decisions are made from the Commissioner's Office regarding that program. There are no negotiations. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Pellman, let me, uh, let me uh, go back to something you said a moment ago. <clears throat> I think you said that you were prepared to resign under what circumstances? If, in fact, players were not suspended and their names were not made publicly notified, if, in fact, it was deferred that instead of that penalty, as was intended, they received a monetary fine that was blinded. Well, according to our review of the policy as presented to us by Major League Baseball, the policy states, and I quote, the results of any prohibited substance testing shall remain strictly confidential. And in the case of a fine, the policy also states that, it, quote, any disciplinary fines imposed on the player by the commissioner shall remain strictly confidential. Um, are you aware of that? My, and in fact, not only am I aware of it, we discussed it, and again, I will let Mr. Manfred explain to you in terms of the technical components to that, but I was assured that in fact those names will be out there and the public will be aware of who is suspended. Let me, let me, let me go back, because I, you know, we've got uh, the Giobaldi's here and we've got Mr. Houdin, and one of the things that has always concerned me is that, particularly when we have the testimony of people who have suffered like these wonderful parents have, is that I don't want them or anybody else to get the impression that, that you know, they come here, they sit through a hearing, they're heard, and in the words of my mother, we have motion, commotion, emotion, and no results. <laughs> and it, it gets rather frustrating because what it does is that it may, it, it's, it, I, I would imagine that it, people can get to a point where they say, throw up their hands and say, why did I, that, did I even go there? Oh, I'm sorry. They, had, they weren't here. I, I, I'll, I'll be happy to yield, but they weren't here. Um, so I just want to ask you a question. All right, I'm going to yield. I'll, I'll yield to, to whoever else is over here. Nobody? Nobody. Oh, Illinois? Nobody. Jose? Oh, okay. Well, go uh, ahead. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, I guess what I'm trying to get to, Mr. Wa Mr. Mr. Waxman was, uh, you know, raised some issues. And I want to know, what are you prepared, you told me you were prepared to, to make it clear that uh, this thing about being able to go away for an hour while you're taking a urine test, that needs to be straightened out. What else are you prepared to recommend to, your, to the folks that you are working with, the commissioner, that is? In other words, as a result of what you've heard today, are there other things that you would recommend? Are you following me with regard to the policy? What more would I recommend? Yes, sir. Well, what I would recommend would be clearly stated by just looking again at the minor league policy. Okay. Which is, in fact, is, a, is an image of a policy that was created without negotiation. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, I yield back to Mr. Waxman, to Mr. Waxman, Chairman. Thank you. I just wanted to see if anybody on our side uh, wanted a chance to ask questions because you're... Uh, okay. I yield to the gentleman. One more. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to take the discussion just a hair uh, away from the central subject, if I might. In our society today, when you turn on television, uh, we see programming like Extreme Makeover, right? And essentially what that programming is telling millions of American people, hey, your bodies are not good enough. You're not a Hollywood star. You're not voluptuous. You're not really strong. You need radical change in your body. To what degree do you think that whole effort in our culture to make everybody beautiful and voluptuous and strong has some impact? Now, I know this is above and beyond taking steroids to hit a home run or pitch faster. Dr. Wadler, how does that influence uh, the taking of steroids and other type of body enhancement drugs? Uh, I don't have figures, but there's no question in talking to my colleagues and talking to people around 
the country, that uh, body image is another important factor here. It's not only about athletic performance, and that, in fact, is probably the major reason why girls are using it. Uh, as a physician, I encourage people to go to the gym, exercise, and so on. They've taken it a step for further and feel they have to use enhancing products. Unfortunately, much of this, in my view, took root in the Dietary Supplement and Health Education Act in 1994, which sort of set the motion in play that you need a powder, a potion of some sort to be better than by eating a regular diet and working out. So there's a whole culture of getting six-pack abs, getting muscular, defined, cut looking, which is totally separate from the athletic enhancement aspects of it. But this. you would agree, I think, that television and the entertainment industry spends huge amounts of money telling us, hey, we're all not strong enough, we're not busty enough, we're not voluptuous enough, you better do something about it. Yeah, I, I would, yes, doctor. Yeah, yeah, and indeed you are touching on something that is very problematic, not just for the anabolic steroids, for a wide variety of drugs of abuse. But indeed, one of the elements, and I mentioned two programs that were very effective in the prevention of anabolic steroids, are actually in targeting exactly, among other things, not just exercising, but light, telling them how to deconstruct the images that the media is putting forth. So these kids sit down and then as a homework, they have to go in into the message and look at them and say, well, this is absurd for this and this. This is not a reality. So part of the training prevention program, which as I said, has shown to be very effective, is allowing the kids to realize that not everything that the media says should be emulated. Thank you. Did anyone else want to comment on that? Uh, yes, I did Doctor. as well. The comment was made that anabolic steroids are hardcore drugs, and this is true, but there's a big difference between anabolic steroids uh, and the people who take them and the people who are using cocaine and heroin. When you take cocaine and heroin, your main goal is to get high. When you take anabolic steroids, your main goal is to make yourself uh, consistent with what our cultural goals are, winning and looking good. Thank you. Time from the gentleman's expired. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. What I would ask, we have uh, two more panels to go. We're asking Adam's going to send five minutes on a side, um, and uh, then we can move to the next panel. Is there objection? Is there objection? Hearing no objection. Uh, Okay, I'll, well, I'll yield your side. I'm going to start on our side, uh, Mr. Issa, and I know that Mr. Osborne has a couple questions. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll, I'll be yielding half my time to Mr. Osborne so we can get through this. Uh, you know, when you're near the end uh, on one of these panels, uh, there's an awful lot that's already been asked and answered, so I'll try to do my, my opening and closing by just working on a couple things that I don't know that were made completely clear. Senator Bunning, I think, made it very clear, in his opinion, that you take steroids, you're cheating. And there should be an asterisk, more or less, be after the name of every record set at a time in which steroids were involved. I think that's a fair characterization of the senator. Uh, <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is just ask each of you, in light of the fact that we know that if you go into a baseball game with a cork bat deliberately, not making any accusations, but if you went in deliberately with a cork bat, and hit extra home runs, you'd be cheating, yes, and that would be clear. Yes or no, for each of you, if you take anabolic steroids, bulk up, and play professional sports, are you cheating? Yes. Definitely. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So then, the second question that goes with this is, should Congress have the ability to make sure that our national pastime, including its exemption from antitrust, there is no cheating. Yes. 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 <laughs> In light of that, I just want to close with my two and a half minutes by saying as a member from San Diego, I'm all too aware that every day young boys go over, many of them can't even drive, they go over by trolley they go into Mexico, they go into a pharmacy, and there are more pharmacies in Tijuana than all the rest of Mexico combined. They go into a room with just the, the pharmacist, they get shot up, and they come back out. And Mexican law protects that pharmacist because it can't be entrapment. That is a problem that we in, in San Diego and with the people of Mexico have to, have to fix. There is no question that they'll continue doing it until we take care of that. But hopefully today we're setting the stage to send the right message. And I, with that, I yield to the gentleman uh, from Nebraska. The gentleman from Nebraska is recognized. 
Thanks, gentlemen, for yielding. yielding. I'd, I'd like to thank you for being here today. The thing I want to mention to you is that we focus so much on the uh, physical uh, effects of steroids, you know, the, the increased risk of heart disease and uh, the competitive advantage, sometimes an increased risk of cancer. But I, I'd really like to thank the uh, parents for being here today because I think maybe the most serious side effect that I see is the emotional component, the mood swings, the roid rage, uh, the tremendously devastating things. I, I think there are an awful lot of really bad things that happen to kids, whether it be suicides, automobile accidents, whatever, that sometimes are never really linked to steroids that really are there. And so uh, I just wanted to thank you all for uh, calling attention to that. <clears throat> and I don't think there's anything that could be more painful to a parent than to lose a child uh, taking their own life. And so uh, just wanted to thank you for being here. Thank you for calling attention to that issue because it's something that kind of flies under the radar screen <clears throat> so much of the time. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Souter. do you have anything you want to put in the record? I have a unanimous consent request. Uh, I would like to insert into the record uh, testimony from Mark McClellan, the Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration before the Energy and Commerce Committee on July 24, 2003, where he praised on Ephedra the National Football League, the NCAA, International Olympic Committee, and specifically not baseball. I think actions speak louder than words. I'd ask you now as consent to insert this. Without objection, it is uh, so ordered. And our side will yield the last five minutes. And let me just say uh, to the parents, thank you so much for your testimony. I know this is difficult for you, but it's something that America needs to hear. Commissioner Selig has been here the whole time uh, listening to this, and I know they're sensitive uh, to it as well. And uh, we appreciate very much your, your being here. And to the medical experts, thank you for shedding light on this very dangerous epidemic. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Clay. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask about human growth hormone. And according to what we know about Jason Giambe's testimony in the Balco case, one of the substances he took was hu human growth hormone. Uh, that hormone acts like a steroid in that it builds muscle. It also changes the physical appearance of players. Major League Baseball officials have told the public that the new policy bans the use of human growth hormone. But my concern is that it appears to be another big loophole. The only drug test that baseball is doing is a urine test, and this does not work to detect the illegal use of human growth hormone. Uh, Dr. Wadler, is it fair to say then that the new policy does not have a mechanism to enforce its ban of human growth hormone? That's absolutely correct. There's been an international consensus on testing for growth hormone. It is only a blood test. There's two different types of tests done. It was implemented in Athens and 300 athletes. There is nothing in the immediate future to suggest there's going to be a urine test. Well, we, we've asked Major League Baseball about this loophole. They have told us not to worry because they have expressed optimism that a urine test for human growth hormone could be available in time for the 2006 season. Uh, I would like to ask if that optimism is justified. There's absolutely no, no basis for optimism whatsoever. Let me ask Dr. Pellman. Uh, yes, I'll be more than happy to comment regarding that. First, the blood test that Dr. Wadler is alluding to is a non-validated blood test. And in fact, was used for the first time by the Olympics, this past Olympics, of which the data has not been released. We've had conversations with both the WADA lab in UCLA in Montreal that has confirmed that to us, as well as my understanding, both as a physician and in my role as an advisor, that taking blood in the United States and checking urine is two very, very different things, complicated in terms of privacy acts, in terms of taking blood and doing urine tests, and again, in terms of my recommendation would be because again, for the record, in terms of what I've told two commissioners, is that my biggest fear is in fact about human growth hormone. I am more worried about human growth hormone now in terms of the future than I am about anabolic steroids. Okay, well, well, well doctor, that doesn't make a lot of sense because the new agreement prohibits blood tests and this agreement lasts until 2008. 
A why is baseball banning the only known test for human growth hormone then? It's not a question of banning it, it's a question of banning blood tests. And in fact, again, in terms of technically speaking, there right now is no valid data test for, the, for human growth hormone. And in fact, I am unaware, and uh, Dr. Green, who is behind me, who is the former chairman of the subcommittee of the NCAA for uh, drug testing, um, who is my expert on this, has informed me that in fact it is again unvalidated. We have no information on it. Doctor, they, uh, they, they use blood tests with Olympic athletes and tennis stars. Can I, can I ask that Dr. Watler try to respond to what Dr. Pellman said, please? Blood testing has become part of the landscape in anti-doping control worldwide for a variety of substances. With respect to human growth hormone, there are two tests. There's the so-called isoforms and a market test. This was, there was a consensus meeting in Dallas last year under the auspices of the United States Anti-Doping Agency. It was clearly a consensus as to how to proceed. It was implemented by the World Anti-Doping Agency with the assurance that the test was validated and, in fact, was implemented and carried out on 300 athletes in Athens. Thank you for that response to the, to the parents. I, may uh, I just ask Dr. Waddle no, one no, question, no, no. which I, I think I will help you. I have a limited amount of time, okay. sir. You can get, get to him after this. To the parents, my deepest sympathies to you on the tragic loss of your young sons. And as a father myself, I cannot imagine how painful this must be for you. And we thank you for sharing both of your son's story. Uh, would you recommend testing high school athletes? Absolutely, for two reasons. Excuse me, I jumped on that one. I feel very strongly. One, we will never, ever know how many kids we got doing steroids without testing. Kids don't admit it, just like our professional athletes don't admit it you got to test. But second, and I think more important and more positive, is at least if there's a testing program, even if it's random, for the good kids, it gives them an excuse to say no. At least there's a disincentive to do it. Right now, no testing, no supervision. There's nothing to keep the players from doing it. Doctor? Secondly, the huge constitutional argument is about the privacy of our youngsters. Um, as a parent, I expect to know everything there is to know when it comes to my child, especially that under 18. I believe it's the parents that hold the rights, not the children. Therefore, if the parents especially would like testing and the schools are for it, it needs to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gentlemen, time's expired. Ms. Watson, uh, we've run out of time. We can give you a quick question, I guess, if, with unanimous consent. I, too, want to extend my sympathy to both sets of parents for being brave and courageous in coming here today. Uh, I'm very disturbed right now because I have a picture of my governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who said that he does not regret using steroids in the 70s because they were not illegal then. But he doesn't want school-aged children to use steroids and at the same time vetoed a bill that would have created a list of banned substances for interscholastic sports and required coaches to take a course of performance enhancing supplements. The Garibaldi son went to USC, which is in my district. And uh, I want to know if you will join with me in seeing that a new bill in the state of California directed towards the high school students and coaches be introduced and would you attend a meeting at USC with me and the coaching staff? We'll absolutely be there. Currently we are working with State Senator Jackie Speer in her reintroducing Senate Bill 37 which targets exactly what it is you're talking about. Thank you very much. And I see this as a public health issue, and we have to make a move now or our children will be impressed by this. They are impressed yes. by that. Thank you we, very much. We also sir. are working with the California Interscholastic Federation, and by I think the first week of May, they will be voting on certification for uh, high school coaches and 
banning accepting sponsorships from any performance enhancing supplement company. Will Thank the gentlelady yield? Um, well, our time's expired. We've got to get on to the next uh, panel at this point. And I just want to thank this panel uh, for the time you've given us today. It's been very, very healthy discussion. I want to thank our medical experts and most of all the parents. Thank you very much. Panel is dismissed. The committee will take about a 10 minute break as we set up for the next hearing. Next uh, round. Stay in. CSPAN.org is a great resource for finding out more about the congressional action that's taken so far concerning steroid use in Major League Baseball. Starting from our homepage, you can click on 109th Congress, and you can find that at the top of the Featured Topics column on the left side of the screen. We're going to get to uh, that in just a second. We want to tell you that at this point in Thursday's hearing, the committee recess for a panel change. The next panel featured Major League Baseball players. And today on C-SPAN, we are showing you as much of this uh, Thursday's hearing as uh, we can on uh, steroid use in baseball. We're going to leave the hearing as the U.S. House gavels in for a rare Sunday session on the uh, Terry Schiavo case. That session expected to be short. And then after the House, we're hoping to resume the hearing with players Jose Canseco, Mark McGuire, Kurt Schilling, and Sammy Sosa. And at some point today, Commissioner Bud Selig and Donald Fear of the Players Union. And now, cspan.org, a great resource for finding out more about the congressional action taken so far concerning steroid use in Major League Baseball. If you start on our homepage and click on 109th Congress, you can find that at the top of the Featured Topics column on the left side of the screen. And that will take you to a page where we have a link to the...